Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Diptarup Khos Dasidar and I'm an assistant professor in the Amity School of Languages, Amity University, Chhattisgarh. And this is the second session that we are having on Robert Browning. And the poem that we are discussing in these sessions on Robert Browning, the first poem is My Last Duchess. So in the earlier session on Browning, we discussed the background of the poet himself. So we knew about Browning as a poet, Browning as a husband, Browning as a man, and uh, the reception and legacy of Browning even today. So we talked about all those in the earlier video. And in this video, we are going to start talking about the poem, My Last Duchess, which is a dramatic monologue. So we'll divide this um, into two parts. So in the first part, we'll talk about, uh, divide this in the sense we'll, uh, I mean, this video will be about two things. So the first thing in this video would be the form and the uh, verse structure. Um, that is, we'll talk a little bit about dramatic monologue, which has already been discussed. And the second part will be about the uh, background to the poem itself. So what is the poem about and what is the story behind the poem? So, first things first, the form, the form in which the poem in which, um, the form, <laughs> the form in which this poem has been written and sometimes the words get jumbled in the mouth, right? And that's very interesting at times. But anyways, sometimes, um, no, not sometimes, the way in which the poem has been written is a dramatic monologue. And we have discussed dramatic monologue earlier as well um, in, in our video on Ulysses. So I'll, I'll do a link to it somewhere around here so that you can know about the dramatic monologue. But just to revise it, there were three things important in a dramatic monologue. Number one, there will be only one speaker. Number two, there will be listeners so it could be one listener or a group of listeners, but these listeners will, they will react to everything that is being said, but they will not respond in any way. So it will be just one speaker speaking to a group of people or a single person who reacts but does not respond. And the third thing that we discussed is that it is spoken at a very crucial juncture of the person's life, of the narrator's life. And that is what we have seen in both the poems, um, like in Ulysses that is, and we are going to see it here as well. However, when it comes to Browning, we get a little more than that. We get something which we did not get in Lord Alfred Tennyson, because mind it, Tennyson used the, uh, you know, the style, but uh, it was pioneered by Browning. So but Browning is one, the one person who has taken the form of dramatic monologue from its inception up till its fame. And the style in which Browning wrote, that is a fourth thing that is added to this. What is the fourth thing? Well, the lines, they literally read, they literally read like a drama. So when you read the poem, you actually feel like you are reading a drama. So there are dialogues and the dialogues are spoken from one to another and you literally feel like a scene is going on. And this is a feel that Browning has been able to give in all of his dramatic monologues as, we, as we'll see. Because we will be discussing initially like two of his monologues. One is My Last Duchess and the second one is Porphyria's Lover. Both of them present in the same volume of poetry. So I I hope that the dramatic monologue part is clear and it's um, pretty much understood. Um, the second thing that is a word structure is that it's also in iambic pentameter in which the end of the rhymes they line. So that's my last duchess painted on the wall looking as if she were alive I call that piece of wonder now Fra Pandol's hands work busily a day and there she stands. So A A B B. So painted on the wall looking as if she were alive I call that piece of wonder now Fra, Fra Pandol's hands work busily a day and there she stands. This is the rhyme pattern so it's like A A B B. So it's in couplets. This is what we call couplets. And uh, when you see the lines, uh, the majority, and we have discussed 
how to scan a line the majority of these lines are in iambic pentameter how to figure out how an iambic pentameter works we have done a video on that as well so check these all out so that you get a better understanding of what is iambic pentameter what is a dramatic monologue so i hope that the form of the poem and the verse structure of the poem is pretty much clear now we can directly move on to the background to the poem which is very interesting because browning wrote most of his um, dramatic monologues based on um, and also many of his other poems be it the ring and the book and everything else he actually based these poems on real historical events on real historical characters dramatic personae another volume which comes out later and the third poem we'll discuss prospice is from dramatic personae by the way which is the other volume this volume in which we have um, my last duchess and porphyria's lover is called dramatic lyrics and uh, the volume called dramatic lyrics lyrics which have a dramatic flavor to them came out in 1842 interesting thing because we are reading poems which came out almost in the same time so first we read um okay we have read lotus eaters right we have read the lotus eaters which came out in 1832 the volume in 1832 it was written in 1829 and then it came out in 1832 we read ulysses which was written in 1833 but then it came out in 18 42 and this poem my last duchess is also from 1842 so we are dealing with poems which came out almost at the same time in history so 1842 dramatic lyrics and why i really like this particular volume called dramatic lyrics is because it has some of the most famous poems and some of my favorite poems by browning so where do we find my last duchess uh, th this dramatic lyrics this is divided into a lot of parts so the second part is called Italy and France which has two poems one for Italy one for France the poem from for Italy is my last duchess because the setting of my last duchess is in Italy we'll see about that and the setting of France the poem for France is Count Gizmond. So, this, this, uh, it is in this section that we have the poem My Last Duchess. It is the second division. Uh, we get, go through a few more divisions and we have another division called Mad House Cells, which is very interesting because in Mad House Cells, he actually goes into the mind of um, another very similar psychotic character and um, that is Porphyria's lover. So we have Porphyria's lover in the section called Mad House Cells, right? Mad House Cells, we have Porphyria's lover. But the cherry on the top, the most interesting poem that we find in this, and it's probably on the top of my list of the best Browning poems, is the Pied Piper of Hamelin. The Pied Piper of Hamelin is the last poem that comes in this particular volume and it is Browning's retelling of a very famous legend of the Pied Piper of Hamelin who um, took a job of taking rats away from a place and instead he was tricked, he was not given the money and so he took all the children of the place away and no one could find the children anymore. So. Uh, horrible story but um, uh, Browning immortalized this story by writing about it in the form of a poem in, and the poem is in this particular volume and that is why I love this volume a lot so dramatic lyrics 1842 now that we have understood a little bit about uh, the uh, you know uh, background of uh, how this poem was written let's understand what is there in the poem who is the speaker of the poem because the poems are clearly based on history so and uh, well even Browning himself hints at it because he begins the poem with Ferrara there is just this one word preceding everything Ferrara what is Ferrara well one who knows geography knows what is Ferrara because Ferrara is 
a place it's a place in Italy and this poem the content of this poem the speaker of this poem is eerily similar the uh, character of the speaker of this poem is eerily similar to that of also not just the character of the speaker but the character and the story of the speaker it is eerily similar to whom to the Duke of Ferrara once upon a time obviously in the in the 16th century so the Duke of Ferrara in the 16th century was a person named Alfonso Alfonso the second the est so this guy Alfonso the second the est was um, the he, he was the fifth Duke of Ferrara I'm just scribbling things on the board because there's so much to write well he was the fifth Duke of Ferrara who was uh, born in 1533 and who passed away in 1598 so from 1533 to 1598 now Alfonso was um, the Duke of Ferrara he was born in 1533 but he was the Duke of Ferrara from around 1558 so around that time um, if not 1558 then 1557 but somewhere around that time 59 probably so he was uh, the Duke of Ferrara and he married um, a very beautiful girl at that time so what I'll do is that I'll make a chart so that you can better understand the relationship between the people because there are a lot of people over here so <clears throat> here I hope you got the spelling of Alfonso. So here is Alfonso, the Duke of Ferrara. He gets married to Lucrezia. Now see, Lucrezia is one of the most uh, beautiful girls of that time. And she's a very little girl. She's not even of the marrying age. She is hardly 14 years old when she is married to this guy, Alfonso. So, um, uh, Lucrezia, who is married to her, um, her full name is Lucre Lucrezia de Cosimo, Cosimo de Medici. Now, if you have played a game like Assassin's Creed, you would know that Medici is a very common um, title and also a royal title in Italy. So, Lucrezia de Cosimo de Medici was the name of the girl who he was married to. They were married in um, 1558 when she was 14 years old and he was 25 years old. So he was 25 years old, she was 14 years old. They were married in 1558 um, and he got a good amount of dowry. So the dowry was very good. You see, why was the dowry good? Well, because Medici family, she was not really that educated. And th that's probably a reason why she came with such a, uh, you know, uh, such a person who's so much older than herself. And she was also the daughter of the Grand Duke of Tuscany. Now, if you know the Grand Duke of Tuscany, what is Tuscany? If you have read Paradise Lost, you would know that John Milton calls Galileo the Tuscan artist. So Galileo is the Tuscan artist. What is Tuscan? Tuscany is a place in Italy where Galileo lived. So Galileo being the Tuscan artist, Grand Duke of Tuscany, Lucrezia di Cosimo of Tuscany, extremely famous and extremely um, rich people over there. So. A kind of new rich people not the old family rich but new rich people the old family type of rich people that is Alfonso new family or what we can say novo rich all right so it's it's like new rich kind of uh, people and these were Lucrezia so they were both married in 1558 but guess what happens he leaves her for two years he just abandons her for two years and in 1561 she dies. Lucrezia dies in 1561 
at the age of 17 so 17 years of age and she dies why does she die it is said that she died because of tuberculosis tb but many people say that she was poisoned we do not know what is true but this idea becomes the plot of the poem was she poisoned or did she die naturally what exactly happened with lucrezia so you see he was married and very soon after his marriage she died why did she die what happened we'll find that out in the poem so maybe not the history but browning's understanding of what might have happened or what was the case why would alfonso kill lucrezia or would he kill lucrezia at all um did lucrezia die naturally or something happened to her we'll know about that in the poem itself now after lucrezia died that is uh, this lucrezia is the last duchess the last duchess why is this important because now alfonso is going for a remarriage a second marriage with barbara now who is barbara people barbara is the eighth daughter of the holy roman emperor ferdinand i so she is the eighth daughter just pardon my spelling here of the holy roman emperor uh, ferdinand i now see, when I say Holy Roman Emperor, I do not mean the Emperor of just Rome. Alright, so the Holy Roman Emperor was actually the King of Bohemia and of Hungary. So what is Bohemia? Bohemia is what today we know as the Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia once upon a time. So that's Bohemia and Hungary. So he was the King of Bohemia and Hungary, so very rich people, right? And Barbara is the daughter of Holy Roman Emperor and therefore again the dowry is very very good so you, you get an idea what kind of a person alfonso is always after the dowry give me the money it doesn't matter to me who the girl is just give me the money give me the dowry barbara says uh, like uh, he's going to marry barbara who is the eighth daughter of the holy roman emperor ferdinand one and she's also the sister of Ferdinand II. See earlier when we had kings, Ferdinand I's son would be Ferdinand II. So Ferdinand I's son, Ferdinand II, his sister Barbara. His daughter, his sister. Now Ferdinand II was the Count of Tyrol. Tyrol is also a place uh, in Italy. So in the poem we find the, um, uh, the, the when is the poem spoken? It is spoken at a crucial moment in the life of Alfonso. Alfonso has, uh, I mean, we don't have uh, 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 this, um, where did she go, Lucrezia anymore. Alfonso is going to marry a second time. Okay. And the second time he is about to marry and the people from the girl side have just come to meet him. And he is explaining what are the things that he wants to see in Barbara what are the things that he expects in Barbara what are the things that he expects as dowry so he talks about all this and so this is a crucial moment second marriage is about to happen so sister of Ferdinand II that is the Count of Tyrol and in the poem why this is important is because he refers to the Count so the person who has come to talk to him is actually the messenger but he refers to a Count being out there somewhere and this count is actually the count of tyrol ferdinand the second who was actually given the task of arranging the marriage of the sister barbara so the father is the emperor the king but the marriage is arranged by ferdinand too and guess who was the messenger who went to alfonso so the name of the messenger is Nicolaus Marduz. Nicolaus Marduz, who is a native of a place called Innsbruck. See, all of this information is going to come in handy when we read the poem actually.
okay so uh, i hope that we have understood these um, this idea this chart first marries lucrezia she dies at the age 17 wants to remarry barbara that is when the poem is happening and why is the poem set in this time because now is a good time to talk about my last touches and why does he want to talk about the last touches he does not want something to repeat so something happened with the last duchess and he does not want that to repeat barbara should know it so better be prepared to marry this man barbara and um, that is where this poem exists that is the structure th that is the story behind this poem uh, so browning takes this episode he finds this interesting this situation is interesting it is dramatic definitely and he creates poetry out of it and as we have seen in the um, last class as well how people actually credited browning to write in such a way that it feels like prose um, we will feel that while we read the poem because um, see even if even if uh, the lines are in the form of couplets rhyming in the form of couplets the lines are not perfect couplets because we have enjambment remember enjambment enjambment is run on lines so the meaning of the first line runs on to the next line and therefore they are not perfect couplets we'll see all of that when we discuss the poem i hope that the story was understood and now in the next video we are going to move into the poem and read the poem in detail thank you so much i hope to see you guys again soon